Good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation. I think the weather was uh, in a conspiracy against this meeting. It's still trying with the cold weather, so it's very nice to be here. Anyhow, um, let me start with a quote on water, which uh, you can read, water mingles with every kind of natural phenomenon, and more than one might imagine, it has also mingled with the particular destiny of mankind. This is, of course, about the, the past, about the history of civilization, but the same could probably be said about the future in terms of um, climate change and, and water resources. And my talk today will relate to two diseases that are very closely related to, to water, uh, waterborne diseases such as cholera and vector-borne diseases such as uh, malaria. And I will focus on uh, climate variability rather than uh, climate change per se, despite the title of this, uh, of this symposium. And in part, this choice is because um, through the studies of uh, retrospective effects of climate variability at seasonal, interannual timescales, we can hope to understand how uh, climate drives epidemiology and then extrapolate into the future. And also, as emphasized in the, in the previous talk, it is through change in the variability itself that we expect climate change to act, and so, so that is uh, at least in part to act. And, and um, examples are changes in the magnitude and frequencies of floods and droughts, uh, droughts for example. Now, the following two slides illustrate some retrospective patterns uh, with typical patterns of variability for these diseases in places where we have uh, uh, highly seasonal environments. For cholera in Bangladesh, from a rural area south of Dhaka, uh, this uh, time series is meant to, to show that uh, in addition to variability, we have pronounced variation in uh, the interannual um, uh, size of outbreaks of cholera, and the same for malaria in semi-arid regions. Uh, the, the red uh, curve shows a time series of retro retrospective cases. This is in northwest India, uh, and you can see by eye some correspondence to the rainfall, which is the limiting resource here for the, the mosquitoes. Now, these are two cases of... Um, uh, low transmission regions, because of these uh, very highly seasonal environments, on average we have low transmission regions, and I'll return to that later, but it is in part in these regions that we expect the uh, high response to, to climate because of the limiting uh, effects of either rainfall or temperatures in other contexts. And thinking about the future, I thought it would be interesting for this, for this meeting to consider uh, the effect of climate forcing in the context of what we can call human-dominated environments. For example, large urban environments of the, in uh, large cities of the developing world and also rural regions with uh, land use change uh, that underlies uh, development. Now, in the recent uh, literature in malaria, we have seen the view that uh, perhaps we should not worry so much about climate change and um, vector-borne diseases because it will be, the effects will be negligible compared to socioeconomic development in the next hundred years. And I'd like with two case studies here today hopefully to emphasize that uh, we need to focus a little bit more on the interaction of uh, climate forcing with uh, that type of, uh, with socioeconomic issues. So, so the, the particular um, examples I like to give today come from retrospective studies of cholera dynamics in Bangladesh. I will start with a large-scale picture of associations with climate, variable, uh, climate variables and then zoom in into the spatial, spatial temporal dynamics within the city of Dhaka. For malaria, I will also um, start with a, a sort of large-scale picture of some associations with climate. Uh, again, for malaria in an arid, semi-arid region of northwest India, and move to higher spatial resolutions in a regional gradient of irrigation-based development. So uh, this is just uh, one result from a suite of uh, uh, analyses that show uh, good associations between the dynamics of cholera in Bangladesh and uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. What this map shows, this is in fact a map of uh, correlations where we take the 
average cases every year post-monsoon. This is the, the second peak of cholera, and we correlated with every grid point of uh, sea surface temperature global grid product. And the colors just show the, the correlations. The black line shows the, shows the, region, the regions above the 90% per, percent, uh, confidence. And you can see this, this region in particular of positive correlation so that uh, warming of this part of the ocean in December, January, February uh, is then followed nine months later by uh, higher peaks of cholera. The same can be seen more or less uh, with, with a less uh, pronounced pattern for the city of Dhaka, and I'll return to that later. So it is interesting that, of course, this region corresponds to uh, the region that warms during the El Niños. And if we, uh, we can ask whether that's just uh, a correlation or whether there is a physical basis for this teleconnection, our climate collaborators uh, have published a number of papers that you cannot see because it's down here on, uh, on numer numerical um, climate simulations showing uh, the linkage between changes in that region of the Pacific and what changes regionally over Bangladesh. And this has identified enhanced precipitation as one of the possible linkages. Uh, that's, uh, these results are in models, but that corresponds also to uh, what we see in precipitation anomalies in years that uh, El Nino years. So, so there is a physical basis for that, and, and based on these results and, and others, we have uh, hypothesized that it is through flooding and the breakdown of sanitary conditions that this uh, El Nino teleconnection is acting on cholera. An alternative set of mechanisms more closely related to the ecology of the pathogen has been proposed by also Rita Colwell and, and, and her colleagues, uh, and this has uh, a lot to do with uh, the survival of the pathogen outside the, the human host in aquatic environments uh, with a focus on the effect of temperature, uh, plankton blooms, and, and other, and other uh, mechanisms very closely connected to the ecology of the pathogen. This is interesting because in these environments you find the pathogen in, in the same, um, in the water. This uh, disease transmits through, the, transmits through a fecal oral route. These are open latrines and this is a fisherman and the situation gets worse in a city like Dhaka where a large fraction of the population has no, no access to clean water. Now we did a lot of uh, modeling on this uh, uh, trying to capture the patterns in this time series with more detailed epidemiological models. And then uh, we, were, uh, we said, well, let's get the data for the city of Dhaka, not for the rural regions, and repeat something like this. But because this is a very different environment than the rural one I just showed you, we, uh, we had to change a little bit how we did it. And this is, uh, this is from a recently published uh, paper, in particular by my postdoc, Robert Rayner. But when we got, got the data, we were very happy because we said, can we have the data resolved spatially within the city? So these are uh, TANAS, districts within the, within the city of Dhaka. Very quickly, let me see if I can do this. Um, yeah, maybe I can do this. No, this is funny because we tested it uh, 10 minutes ago. It doesn't matter. I'll tell you what this is. Anyhow. This is a mystery, it did play a few minutes ago. So what you were meant to see, and what we saw when we got this, and we're so happy to have spatially resolved data, was that first of all, uh, the, the dynamics were extremely uh, stochastic. With places you had no cases, then you get cases. So that was a problem because our previous models uh, couldn't handle that, that uh, too well. And then you would have seen, if you looked at this for a long time, that when you have peaks uh, in the aggregated prevalence of the disease, uh, there was a suggestion that the core of the city surrounded by that dark line was were, responded uh, more intensive, intensively and differentially with respect to the rest of the city. So we built a, a different type of model because of the stochasticity um, of this data and to test whether we had to consider the seed that there was heterogeneity within the city in the response. And one main motivation here is that, of course, we think of climate forcing at regional scales, uh, so we generally aggregate the data. But I'd like to show you 
uh, that that may be a problem and, and there is a, a question of the scales at which the susceptibility of the human population responds. So the details of the model do not matter. What we did was to classify the disease levels into three levels and then do a, a, a model that essentially says if you are in uh, the state of no cholera or high cholera, medium cholera, what's your probability of moving to another state? And so we have this, uh, this uh, matrix of condition probabilities which we feed from the data and then uh, we can, what we did in the model is to consider first that we could have two groups of uh, districts with different probabilities also that the probabilities were affected by ENSO and that uh, it mattered whether your neighbors had a, a high case of a high situation for cholera, etc. Because these models are nested, you can actually feed them and with some uh, likelihood test, uh, tell whether the more complicated model is, um, is actually doing better or not. This here shows, for example, the, the basic probabilities modified by the sea surface temperature anomaly, uh, which in, in this case can take a nonlinear uh, form. And then we fitted these models, and without going into the details, what I wanted to show you is that there is very strong statistical, statistical support for these two groups of the city. In fact, if we didn't separate uh, the, the, the dynamics uh, in the two places, we couldn't fit the data. There is also very interestingly support for an interaction between uh, climate forcing and spatial heterogeneity. So for example, the effect of ENSO is significantly different between the two groups and also uh, this is the case for flooding. And the ENSO effects, effect has this lag that is consistent with what we had seen before. Now we use this model then to ask about prediction, short-term prediction. Uh, by removing one year at a time, which is not ideal, but it's what we can do with this kind of data. And I, I'm just showing here the data in black, the predictions are in, in blue, and then if you look in particular at two El Nino years, we can sort of have a probability of seeing uh, cases above, the, for example, the 75% uh, percentile of the data this is the prediction, the observation, and in these cases, we would have predicted 99% chance of having an out a very large outbreak, and the same almost for May 2003. So this is just to show that this model has some predictive ability. Now, you can ask what is different between the two parts of the city. We don't have very good data for this, I must confess, but I wanted to show you that there are uh, differences in socioeconomic indicators. For example, the density in the city, and this is, uh, this is not a mistake in the zeros, this is 100,000 people for, by kilometer square. And this here shows uh, the concentration of the poorest type of housing. So some suggestion that this connects to uh, what we add to sort of human factors. We can also ask about the flooding in the city, something that we are looking at right now. But to summarize this part of the talk, uh, I have shown that, uh, well, in this work and, and previously, that there is a strong connection to ENSO and flooding for the post-monsoon cholera outbreak, and that this effect of El Nino is partly through uh, precipitation and associated flooding. We can therefore ask what will happen with climate change, in particular in terms of the uh, floods, uh, floods frequency and intensity. Uh, but that this population susceptibility shows pronounced geographic variation within a city such as Dhaka, with a part of the city really acting as a susceptible core. And we have to ask what uh, in these large cities as they develop, we have, this is a city with around 15 million people that is uh, thought to um, double very quickly in the next decades. So urban population growth, access to clean water and sanitation, is key here, clearly, from what we, what we have seen. And you can say, well, for those of you that know the history of cholera, the discovery of its waterborne transmission, this is John Snow revisited. John Snow was the father of geography and epidemiology who identified the pump in London, the streets where uh, the, the disease, uh, the origin of the, the disease was related to this pump. A wonderful book on this, the history of science. Well, this is John Snow revisited, but in the context 
of climate forcing an omega city of the developing world. And my feeling is that if we uh, ignore this type of uh, variation in susceptibility in the future, uh, our models may not do as well. You can also say, well, this is just cholera, and this is a slide meant to emphasize that maybe we should do some comparative uh, analysis for different groups of diseases. This is another diarrheal disease, uh, shigellosis, with a different ecology, different transmission pathway. Uh, as far as I know, the bacterium that causes shigellosis does not survive uh, in, the, in the aquatic environment in the way that Vibrio cholera does. It transmits through water and food much more directly. Uh, if I ask you which of these maps is cholera, which one is Shigella, uh, shigellosis, uh, in this case shige, caused by Shigella flexneri, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell. And the same applies to DACA. The, the point I'm making is that there may be uh, systemic uh, uh, behaviors of groups of diseases within these environments that are very similar. Let me change, change gears to a different disease and uh, a, a bit the, uh, the opposite pattern. This is a very dry area in Northwest India. These are the, the states of Gujarat and, Rurast and Rajasthan for which we have retrospective data at the level of districts. And um, this is the district of Kutch. I'll, I'll focus on these. These are some districts in Rajasthan. And then I'm going to move in this direction and down in a gradient that has higher irrigation and higher development. These are the data I showed you before for one of the districts. This is Kutch, uh, reported cases from 19, well, this is 20 years. And not surprisingly, this is a desert. This disease is transmitted by mosquitoes. If I uh, look at uh, accumulated rainfall in previous six months and cases, you see this type of threshold uh, behavior with a lot of noise. And if we look in the same way as we did before at um, what happens in the, um, in the oceans that may be of interest to us to have longer lead times for prediction, for example, we were surprised by this uh, pattern where uh, we are now taking the cases in the peaks of malaria and correlating them, correlating them with the, the, the whole uh, map of uh, SSTs, sea surface temperatures. And we were looking to find something perhaps here because of the, the history of uh, relationships between ENSOs and, ENSO and the monsoons, uh, which of course has changed over, in, in, uh, in over decades. And we, we were somewhat surprised by finding this negative correlation with the tropical South Atlantic. Uh, that was a bit of a surprise, and of course some people, my climate colleagues said, no, no, this must be wrong. Uh, it must just be, um, perhaps it has no physical basis, some sort of association. Anyhow, it was interesting. There was a bit of uh, literature about connections of this region with the monsoons, but I'm showing you this because the point is the link with rainfall is strong enough to tell you something about climate. And in fact, um, if you look at the correlation between disease and rainfall, not surprisingly, it's a regional, uh, you see this regional effect over India. But this, semi, this uh, map that is somewhat similar is the result of some numerical climate simulations in which the conditions in the uh, tropical South Atlantic are fixed uh, to study what is their effect over India. And we have this uh, relationship with increased rainfall. So this is from a paper that uh, is in press and suggests that there is this link between the Atlantic and uh, rainfall and therefore malaria. And we have used then models um, that incorporate, and I'm not going to describe this in detail, simple epidemiological models of transmission in which the force of infection is a, func is a function of rains. And anyhow, we feed these models and we can um, basically test models with rainfall, without rainfall, compare them to each other statistically just by eye, and, and you would expect that the one with rainfall does better. But I'm showing you this because it's a strong relationship. These are not fits. The data, again, are here in red. I don't know why this disappears. The, the simulations without uh, the, the median of many stochastic simulations 
are shown here in black and then the uncertainty in gray. And you can see uh, these are simulations from estimated initial conditions for 20 years and we capture a fair, fair amount of the variability. Now, all these will not surprise you after all these are semi-arid regions. But what I think is interesting is to us, well, when we are in a district like this, that has been very, uh, very uh, unmodified by humans and we go to a place like the one in the left, that's the district of Keda, lots of agriculture uh, supported by higher mean rains, but also irrigation. And we did compare then a gradient in, uh, we can rank these districts in terms of their uh, irrigation levels. And what is interesting here is to see through these maps uh, in the different districts from least aggregated to more aggregated, you have here the correlations for different maps with, uh, with uh, remote sensing variable that measures vegetation on the ground, NDVI. And what I'm showing you here is as you move in this direction, the, the red, uh, the significant and high correlations that we find regionally disappear when we move to these districts. So you can say, well, maybe uh, there is no, no longer a link between rainfall and disease. But if you look more carefully at, uh, at the time series, you see an interesting pattern. Of course, uh, the problem with studying disease is that people are interfering with your studies all the time, and that by the time you understand something is no longer the same. So that's sometimes bad and sometimes interesting. Here we have the, the cases in, in red, the rain in the dotted line, and this is data on the degree of control to spraying <coughs> mosquitoes. This is insecticide residual spraying levels. And you can almost get the sense that there was less control before, but uh, we have this, this data from 1996 when they intensified control. And you can see that uh, they are doing fairly well here, high control, low cases. And now they get a surprise. This is one year with large rainfall and a relaxation of control. So if you plot the population covered by, by uh, spraying versus the cases in the previous two years, you have this very nice relationship, which is in part the result of a reactive policy that uses previous cases to decide where to actually intervene. Uh, at some level, if resources are limited, and simply from the, the perception of risk, uh, systems of control respond and relax on some time scale. And in this, in this type of environment, when this is combined with uh, high rains, you can see these responses. Now, if you, if you look even at higher spatial resolutions, you see uh, a very interesting pattern. I'm taking now this district and, and, and the adjacent districts at the higher spatial resolution of uh, what is called talukas, uh, these uh, sub-districts, um, for which we also have cases from 1997 to, to 2011. And very quickly, I want to show you some interesting patterns. First of all, this is a map of regions that are irrigated. In, uh, this is from very detailed remote sensing in 2009. This is a blind analysis that takes the space time data and does some grouping based on a model uh, of, uh, of the same kind that I showed you for cholera. But interestingly, you get two groups that map very well. This is one group with diff, uh, lower cholera, sorry, lower malaria, and then the higher, uh, high, higher malaria here. And so you have these two groups that behave differently. More interesting to me is that uh, Okay, that was irrigation in 2009. What if we look at how irrigation has changed in the last decade? Unfortunately, we didn't have the data, so we use a trick that worked very well in these regions. If you look at NDVI vegetation in January, it reflects irrigation because at that time, obviously, there is no rain. So that's, that allows you to map very well uh, irrigation from a very simple threshold in January. So this is the change in irrigation over a decade. And it is in this boundary region where a canal has moved and it's not officially open, but people are using it, at least from remote sensing we can see it. 
It is at the boundary of these two groups that we see the highest change in irrigation. So you can ask, well, what has happened to malaria? And what has happened to control? First, you can see in this map, if we look uh, through time, and this is for the first five years, but a similar map applies in the second. If we say the relative risk of malaria, this is, this is normalized incidence relative to the highest place, the, the highest risk is found in that boundary. So overall, they are uh, bringing the disease down, but over that decade, these regions with the, the, the highest change in the landscape are the, the ones in the higher risk. So you can say, well, what about control? Maybe they are not controlling. Well, this is where they are controlling the most. So what I'm showing here is the, a map, again, relative to one of this uh, IRS, this spraying of mosquitoes, they are spraying like crazy. This is population cover, percent population cover. These sub-districts here are the ones with high risk and high control where they are covering of the order of 80% of the population. And that, again, everything is going down slowly, but this pattern persists. So, in summary, we have the following situation. These places here have been irrigated for decades and they have low risk. They are in that sort of sustainable low risk situation. Why is another discussion? Here we have very rainfall driven dynamics and in the middle we have the irrigation change with the malaria risk and high control. This defines therefore these uh, regions of high risk due to climate variability and regions of, uh, in this kind of transition regime that is not new in the literature, but what is new is that this can last over a decade. So this is over a decade of trying to control something and, uh, and essentially having these types of dynamics where you have unexpected surprises. So again, these are not, uh, these are not, uh, these are not stable situations and they can revert to this once you relax control. So, with these examples, I've tried to show you that um, the, as we try to look into the future, of course, we can always make uh, projections for, for risk uniquely based on the environment, and that will be valid, but that uh, there, is also in, there will be important interaction, interactions with development that will be uh, very dynamic and that uh, cannot be ignored, but it does not mean that we are not going to see effects of climate because of development. I think uh, that studying uh, urban environments is important, but also taking advantage of regional gradients, where we have data for these regional gradients and under seasonal forcing, to look at these different stages of development and understand how they may affect the effect of climate is important. And also that regions with pronounced seasonality, uh, these regions that we call in the case of malaria unstable regions at the edge of the distribution that have low transmission and these very epidemic dynamics, those are very important uh, regions to look uh, to understand both the problems of emergence but also the problem of elimination. As we move these systems close to those boundaries, we are going to move them from uh, more stable, high, uh, high rates to very dynamic situations with these sort of uh, more epidemic and surprising dynamics. And I think this, these regions today, which uh, I showed you for India in the case of deserts, but we can also uh, consider in, uh, in Africa, for example, with altitude, the limitation of temperature um, affecting ma the malaria distribution in some of the highland regions. Uh, in Africa, uh, those are also interesting, very important regions to study today to have a picture of what will happen with climate change. And I think Matt uh, will talk about those regions later. I have to end, but I, I have one slide on climate change because, uh, because of the, the I, I am finishing. Uh, so so uh, I, men I, I mentioned comparisons of uh, groups of related diseases. I think we don't do enough of this, and it's important because I think it can tell us about pathways of action of climate, the most important pathways, 
And personally, I think that for the diarrheal diseases, it's really the human susceptibility due to, uh, to sanitary conditions, etc., that matters. So, so uh, uh, as long as we don't take care of that, we are going to see surprises of climate. But then these comparisons of projections with ensembles of malls, maybe we will hear Madeleine Thompson talk about this. I know um, she is working on those types of uh, comparisons. I wanted to show you that uh, when we do that, this is a simple example for uh, Thailand. In this is for Kenya, projected percent change in people exposed to falciparum malaria in Kenya. And just to show you that if you look at this line here, uh, you see different symbols. These are uh, different models. In one case, the black dots are just from a statistical model relating malaria to altitude as a proxy for temperature, the percent of the population that will be affected by the disease percent change. And the other colors come from two places in the literature. One is a time series model, the other uses more complicated suitability thresholds. But those projections are all uh, very similar and can give us some confidence that we understand the problem. I don't think we, we do enough of this. And now to finish, I want to thank some of the people that did the work. My student Andres Baeza for the work in India. Also uh, my colleague uh, Aaron King in the department. I mentioned my postdoc, my previous postdoc. And then my colleagues both from Bangladesh, Mohammed Yunus and uh, colleagues, colleagues from India and uh, Meno Buma from the London School of uh, hygiene and tropical medicine. And finally, finally the funding in particular, uh, Noah, I know Julie has, uh, Julie Tratton who is here has put a lot of effort in this uh, program in the past Oceans and Health that, uh, that has tried to fund a lot of work at this interface with the uh, infectious diseases and climate. Thank you very much. <laughs>